welcome once again to the um, second episode of the Eurotech Talks. Uh, my name is Daniel Nachrebecki and I am Senior Software Engineer, Project Lead and uh, the Oro Commerce Trainer in Oro. Um, today we will be talking about uh, the headless e-commerce and how you can use this approach in the Oro Commerce, uh, existing Oro Commerce project or the new project that you will be building. Um, and just one more thing before we start, uh, guys, the tech talks are for you. So. If you can, please think about the topics that you would like to hear about in the next sessions, and uh, then just, I don't know, you can drop it, you can post it here or just drop me an email uh, here in the chat, I mean, and then we will try to prepare something based on uh, the feedback, based on your feedback. Uh, the whole webinar is split into two parts. Uh, the first, in the first one, we'll cover the theory, and uh, while the second one will be mostly about uh, the, practical examples and uh, you may ask you may ask what to expect from the first uh, part it's mostly um, we will be discovering what is meant by the headless e-commerce what are the advantages of that particular approach and what are the benefits if you would like to adopt it adopt the whole architecture uh, the second part will be the main part, uh, and we will have the live coding session. Um, you will have obviously the access to the repository, it's publicly available, and we will see how easily you can build a headless application uh, based on the Oro Commerce backend. The application will be um, implemented in the next JS uh, using the React uh, components, and this is obviously. Uh, the POC, right? It's not like a production ready application. This is just to, uh, to show you the whole idea. Uh, if you have any questions, just don't hesitate to use the chat. Uh, so I have the chat tab uh, open and uh, if I'll be able to, uh, to answer the questions, we will cover that at the end of the session. Um, okay, so uh, what that all headless approach is about. Mm. And I promise you that the definition is very, very easy. The, the whole approach is pretty straightforward. But instead of like revealing the whole truth um, from in the, like, you know, in the first minutes, um, and let's approach that or let's start, let's kick it off from the, uh, from the bit different angle. So when I was preparing for the webinar, um, I found a quite thoughtful uh, quote in one of the Gartner studies, uh, it is from uh, the 2018, that an efficient and customer-friendly online commerce experience is no longer a differentiator. It is mandatory. But what does that exactly mean? If you're building the e-commerce or the application, is it is it customer-friendly? Or if it is customer-friendly, is it friendly enough? And how to measure that? And this is where things get quite complex because there is no like a clear answer to that, right? Um, you cannot say it like for sure because this is this is the customer's perspective. This is the whole experience that they will have when visiting your site. But let's have a look at the example. So fasten your seatbelt and um, have a time travel. Let's have a time travel to back to 90s. This is a screenshot from the eBay. I found it uh, in the internet. This is the screenshot from 1995. And I'm curious, when you just look at the example, would you say that uh, this portal, this site, is it like customer friendly? Well, we don't know, right? We only see the design. We might have some assumptions. We may think that uh, you know maybe the customer experience is not their, their, their first focus. However, this is just an assumption, right? Because my, maybe the processes are really smooth. But uh, what I mean here is that even you know, like even the design is an important important part of that. Even though you cannot say for sure whether the, that site is customer friendly or not, you uh, you can assume. You can assume. But what we know is that uh, the companies back then in the nineties they were not really. Um, or let me put it this way, they were focused mostly on the transactions. They were not, um, there was not like a solid understanding of the customer experience and how it affects the businesses. But guys, it's not, it's no longer 90s. 
uh, we are like we have the technology all around us and the, this is why the technology, the general technology awareness is growing. So if we use the technology on a daily basis, we might have the same expectations when we access the e-commerce portals as well. So that's why the users will expect the better experience from you and the better and better um, customer satisfaction. Mm, it's not just that, uh, you know, like they access the page and the only thing is that, um, that they need to finalize the purchase. No, it's all about how they feel at the site. Uh, they need to feel that it is targeted or even sometimes personalized for them. And it's not that, you know, just I'm saying that, right? Just ask yourself when you buy something, but you're using, I'm pretty sure you're most likely using B2C like personally, but even B2B. When you buy something, when you try to buy something and you either can not find the product easily, so you search for a product and some different product appears, or you have uh, some really complex configuration options, you're overwhelmed by the possibilities, you know, or even the whole process takes too long. Uh, you may feel frustrated and those things that frustrate you uh, might cause the fact that, you know, the, the, the company will lose. Uh, will lose their visitors, their customers. So that's why this is very important to keep the whole journey and the whole customer experience on high level. Uh, but taking a look at that customer perspective, let's assume that, uh, you know, like we have a shiny website, uh, you know, the processes are smooth, uh, uh, the whole experience is like splendid. Is it enough? Well, that might not be enough nowadays. Uh, I told you that the technology, and you know that as well, technology is all around us. So nowadays users, you know, like expect even more. So they not expect just better, but they expect a different experience from different device, devices. And those experiences must, must, must be at the same time consistent. So if you have mobiles, um, mobile app devices, you might expect some gestures, um, um, ability to work offline, some kind of like, you know, maybe voice control devices, wearables, IoT, smartwatches, you know, that the, the, the spectrum of possibilities or the possible touch points um, for the regular e-commerce is growing. And most of them, of, of what I said, is true for B2C. However, what we see, we see the trend in B2B as well, that those expectations from B2C are transferred to our uh, uh, to, to B2B as well. And why is that? Because like more and more people that got used to those kind of experiences are now the, uh, the people that make decisions in B2B. So this is just how um, how the people how how people work. But uh, on the other hand, we also have a company's perspective. So um, in a quickly changing market, which uh, definitely e-commerce is, uh, the companies need to deliver fast. They need to innovate, test, experiment. Um, in other words, they need to have like a short time to market. Because otherwise, if they, uh, you know, like if they, if they don't do that, uh, their, competitor, their competitors will do that and they, and they will lose. So, uh, Let's have a look at the example. Uh, if you have, if let's say most of your users use uh, TikTok or spend most of their time on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, uh, you won't reach them using an ad in the newspaper, right? Because it's just, you know, it's not targeted for them. So that's why companies need to build specific solutions. And last but not least, uh, this is our perspective, our perspective, right? IT team, IT team's perspective. Mm, if e-commerce is a quickly changing market, which I mentioned in the previous slide, um, let's say that we can compare that IT, also how, how quickly that changes. In IT, we use the fuel from one of the Elon Musk rockets, right? We are changing so quickly. Every month, there is probably some new library or technology, you know, especially in JavaScript. Uh, you have everything, uh, all the time you have something new. So we need to keep up. That's why we also, we as developers, as, as IT teams, we need to um, we need to keep up and follow the trends. So uh, it, it's not necessarily need to be that, you know, like uh, that. Um, let's let's put it this way. 
uh, you know, like in totally new technologies or totally new fields, areas like IoT or the artificial intelligence. Sometimes also like those smaller things, like uh, the trend of passwordless authentication, right? Those kind of things also, those kind of trends also might keep um, keep you in the uh, in the business. Uh, simply developers, they want to learn, they want to use new technologies as nobody wants to stay or maintain the, uh, you know, like 20 years old software or use PHP 5 when we have like PHP 8 at the market. Uh, it's simply all about the technical debt. So let's put it all together. We have the customer uh, perspective, we have the company's perspective and developers or IT teams, IT teams perspective. And let's see how the headless can help us with that. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is like a silver bullet, right? Uh, it's not, but let's introduce uh, the definition of the headless. So in the traditional or uh, monolithic approach, we have everything tied together. We have the presentation layer together with the business logic. Uh, you know, like everything is, is in a single finished product. The whole stack uh, is there. Excuse me. Uh, and like, you know, this is this is pretty straightforward approach that all of us um, are probably aware of. And on the other hand, we have the headless, which uh, I promise you the definition will be very, very easy. Uh, so the definition is that the front end layer is decoupled from the back end. So the front end is simply, pretty sure you know, um, uh, is the, the things that the users see, while the backend is the heart of the system, right? Containing all the business logic. Uh, in Oro Commerce, this is the place where all the pricing rules are being calculated. You have your customers with tier pricing, with contact, uh, with contract pricing, um, with multiple merge uh, strategies. And then at the end, customer, the only thing the customer sees is just a single price, right? It's not probably most likely, it's not aware of that whole complexity that, it, that is um, um, being executed or being done in the backend. So uh, we may think, or the whole idea actually, the whole idea is, is to separate the UI, which would be our head, from the backend, which will be our, let's say, body or the heart, and cut off the head and keep it totally separately. So this is the whole definition of the headless. Um, but you know, if you cut off the head, you still need to have some solid connection between the two. I mean, they, even though they are separated, they need to talk to each other somehow. They need to be, they need to still be connected um, in some way. So in the usual approach, <laughs> usually you need to have some kind of a spine or a neck to connect the two. Here, our neck would be an API. So the API to connect the two. Um, and, you know, like neck has to be really strong or, or not really strong, but strong enough for, for, for the head to want to fall. Um, and this is also true for our API. It has to be reliable. It has to be flexible. It has to be simply strong to cover all our requirements from the B2B, especially in B2B, but not only. Um, and we have also a third approach, which Oro Commerce is one of the examples of, the hybrid approach. So you have a monolithic e-commerce backend. Mm, you have some kind of a default templating. In Oro Commerce, this is Twig together with the Backbone and Chaplin, jQuery. Uh, but also at the same time, you have the extensive API, right? So really like the strong neck to be the headless ready. Um, and in, or, in oral commerce, you can use both of the approaches, right? So that's why this is hybrid. You have the default UI, but let's say if you have some separate front-end teams that are specialized in different technologies, feel free to use the different um, uh, technology stack that we will be covering also in a minute. So just to, guys, just to understand it correctly, there are three approaches. Right, but there is like none of them is better or worse, right? They are just different, like human beings. There is no like a silver bullet that will cover all of your use cases. It is your responsibility to find the right solution for your use case. But 
our webinar is about the headless. So that's why I won't be focusing on all of them, but I will focus only on the uh, advantages of uh, this particular approach, of the headless approach. Um, so when I was preparing the, the, the list of the advantages, my goal was to create a condensed knowledge, because even though this is like a tech talk, uh, this is our responsibility of the IT teams, of, of the project leads or tech leads to also assess the technology or assess the approaches, right? So you have also here, and the slides will be obviously provided to you after the webinar, those kind of condensed knowledge that you can use as a reference, uh, as a reference when you will be assessing the, the headless approach. So first thing, let's assume that you have an existing e-commerce company, like, I don't know, 100 developers, you have dedicated teams that are really like specialized in um, React or Vue.js or any other technology. And then product owner comes to you and says like, guys, um, we have made a decision of using a product, but it is built in totally different technology. And for the sake of the webinar, let's call this technology ABC. And now there is a tough decision, whether to learn the ABC technology, you know, maybe this is very old technology and nobody wants to maintain it, or should we just approach it differently? So in the headless approach, when the UI, our head, is totally separated from the backend, uh, the teams can use their current experience in building the software using the stack they know. And if you're using React, just use React. If you're using Vue.js, let's use Vue.js, right? The whole complexity is always in the backend, right? So not always, but it's usually in the backend, all the business logic. Uh, and it not might, it's maybe not even like, you know, like a new technology, that ABC technology. Maybe they just don't want to stick to the existing templating system, right? Maybe they don't want to use Tweak at all. They want to use, uh, they already established, I don't know, like a bunch of existing React components that would fit the requirements or the requirements of the project best. Um, so yeah, with a headless approach, uh, this is also like a possible. And uh, let's have a bit bigger picture. So if you have a technology agnostic system, right? So you have that headless approach, you can build even more. So we have our UIs or the touch points that I, that I mentioned, you know, like mobile, PWA, or those voice control devices or whatever, name it, all those buzzwords sometimes. Um, you know, they are built around our e-commerce backend, our Oro commerce in this case, backend. Uh, you know, like when, when, when the new idea emerges, let's say virtual re reality or the artificial intelligence will be really like accessible for the B2B. And it is actually right now. But if you're, if the new idea emerges in your business, you can simply build that block and add it to the existing system. And this is how you can actually, like you know, by building and adding those uh, elements, you can build an open environment. And it very quickly it becomes not only the system, but it becomes an ecosystem. So uh, the the thing that you are building is that you know like by by adding those blocks right by adding those blocks you are ex extending the, the the whole ecosystem and you don't need to mix everything in a single application because we know that the bigger stack results simply in more complexity more performance issues and all the other things that are related uh, and uh, here you can also like, but this is probably topic for another webinar, but here you can also like delegate those complex processes, right? So if you have those open, this open environment, let's say if you have a complex registration process that involves like, like a DocuSign uh, or some legal activities, and you, mo you maybe you have already a, a service or a microservice in this case that already does that, right? So it will be easier for you to kind of like attach the new requirements to the existing ecosystem in this case. Um, okay, number three, um, the user experience. So we talked about the customer experience already, but you saw eBay, right? What was, I, I, I'm curious, I'm curious, what was your first thought? Uh, 
and you know it's, it's all about the design but uh, and we know like that we never should ju uh, judge a book by its cover but actually uh, again by preparing for this webinar i found some studies that says that web designers have about 50 milliseconds 50 milliseconds a blink of an eye uh, to make a good first impression and we know that this good or positive first impression lead to the higher general satisfaction of the site you think or you assess those uh, those uh, services of those or those uh, websites to be kind of like more reliable even though they not necessarily might be true but by having that first impression you can have the first assumptions and the more we know about how customer experience influence the business uh, the more it gets kind of like a prioritized and the, the more modern frameworks more uh, modern tools they have it uh, prioritized prioritized as well so they have those kind of small things that improves the experience of the whole journey, either built in or at least they are focused on it. Um, when talking about the user experience, it is also important to cover personalization. So um, I mentioned that at the beginning, uh, but this is actually just a one small context of the big topic of personalization. But if your system, uh, that might be in that open ecosystem, of the open environment has uh, a different roles or actors of the system, right? So let's say you have buyers that want to easily find and purchase products. You have sellers which want to easily upload and promote their products. And at the same time, you have content editors which want, who want to uh, create articles, some marketing stuff, call to actions, etc. So what I mean he's here is that they not necessarily should have the same experience. Maybe they, they, they will, but maybe you should, you know, like personalize the experience that fits just right to them. Maybe content editors, if they want to build a fancy web landing pages or the marketing tools, maybe they don't need to see the whole or the everything that is, you know, like behind the system, right? Just the one simple application that will do the thing and simply synchronize the data because we are talking here about the results and the outcomes of some processes to our system. And then we will show that to our buyers. Uh, and actually, this is a use case that we'll be covering uh, very soon for the, um, the, during the session, during the practical session. Uh, number five, performance. Uh, so we've all been there, right? Struggling, analyzing, performance issues, bottlenecks. Uh, with the monolithic apps, there, you know, like there might be some cases where you have uh, some kind of resources loaded, even though they sometimes are not needed. Maybe assets are loaded, so maybe some other resources, some requests are being made that not necessarily are needed in this particular case. Um, and in the headless approach, when you have it separated and you, you know, like here by using some modern frameworks, modern tools, you can utilize those kind of new optimization techniques, like for example, pre rendering techniques in Next.js, right? So instead of using a varnish to just, you know, like have that kind of caching mechanism in, uh, in front of our application, we can use some built in optimization techniques. Uh, the next thing scalability. So and this is not obvious. Uh, so if your application is under the heavy load, maybe that doesn't mean that the whole components are under the same load. Maybe if you separate the head from the heart, um, you have you, you, you may notice that the front end is under heavy load, but using the caching mechanism, the back end will not have the same issues. So by using those different scalability methods right you can scale your front end to provide more resources and then you know like because of the caching they are not reaching back end that much so you can simply optimize your whole resources usages uh, by uh, you know applying different methods for both the back end and the front uh, number seven independent releases and this is a good one so uh, the use case, let's, let's, let's think about the use case where you have like a huge enterprise software, you know, like e-commerce platform that is connected to multiple channels. You have multiple API, you know, like calls, uh, warehouses that are pushing the data, uh, you know, 
thousands of requests per minute. In other words, huge enterprise software. And the, let's assume that you need to do some, just one small minor change to the theming, right? Uh, you see that the layout is broken. The product listing is not properly displayed. I don't know, like, uh, you know, like for, for, for some, for, for some cases. So the thing is that you need to apply some CSS change. And by separating the concerns, you don't need to release the whole platform if the only thing you need to do is just to fix the front end, right? So if you have multiple applications talking to your backend, you don't need to have a downtime for that main backend, the heart of the system, because you will just simply release the front end, right? So independent releases. And it's not obvious, but yet how powerful at the same time, right? And last but not least, innovate and test. I think that this is one of the most, um, this is very important, right? Because like you need to, I told you, I told you, you need to keep up. You need to, uh, to, to follow the trends. And you can, by separating the UI, you can experiment with new ideas, but without breaking already established experience for existing users, right? So if they have already a, established experience uh, it won't get broken because of the because of that uh, of that innovations right because simply they will be built those innovations will be built around your backend as a totally separated block um, okay and uh, since this is oro tech talks and not oro business talks uh, i think that this is enough for kind of like introducing the headless Let's see right now how we can um, utilize that approach or how we can use uh, the headless approach, how easily you can use the headless approach in oral commerce. Uh, before we start, I think that this is a good, maybe good. No, I, I'll give you the, um, I will give you the, the link to repository just in a minute. But in order for, for to, to, to use properly the headless uh, or the Oro commerce as a headless, you need to know the few concepts. So in Oro, we have two types of API. And I told you, our NAC, our API, uh, really powerful. Uh, here will be, um, here is uh, kind of like divided into the storefront and the back office API. So let me switch to this one. So under the admin API doc, you see the swagger, so the documentation of all our resources for the backend API, right? So this is the back office, sorry, this is the back office API. And here we can see also that you are signed in as an administrator, right? So this is the, your admin user. And here, when you access the API doc, you will see the storefront documentation. So those endpoints are related to the customer user. Have a look here. You are signed in as a um, Amanda buyer, which is you, who is a user for our storefront, right? So this is the storefront of our Oro commerce. And at the same time, this is the, uh, this is the admin, right? This is the admin part, admin API, storefront API, and the storefront um, UI here. For the um, for establishing a connection, you need to authenticate, right? So those requests need to be authenticated. We use the odd too for that. And really important thing is that we also use the authentication for the guest accesses, right? So we will be using a password a password type grant type for the odd too, and we will be using a guest username and the guest password um, for our kind of like authenticated as a non-authenticated user. Um, and when building the headless application here, you can either leverage the existing endpoints, uh, if you have the swaggers, or create new ones that also will be the case of the fourth use case that we will be covering in a minute. Uh, and again, this is not a training, right? This is just a webinar. So here you have a link to the training if you're interested to see and hear more. Um, Okay, so we will be using headless or a local host. This is the application that is built on my local host. 
<clears throat> and the first thing what we need is to generate a public and private keys in order for the OAuth to work properly. Right here you have a link how to generate public and private keys. I will also show you that in a minute how to do that on a local environment in the console. But you need to have it and attach it to your instance. Then you also need to create a storefront auth ap application. Here you have the documentation on how to do that. And this is oh, actually this is a wrong uh, link. Uh, yeah, I'll find you and fix that in after the webinar. Uh, you need to create the system storefront auth application. Here I have it already, headless local with the password grant type. And this is our client ID. And once we are generating the application, we will see the, uh, we will see the, um, the client secret as well. And once we have it, so once we have the storefront auth uh, uh, application, we can start building the headless. So guys, as promised, this is the, um, the link. I will paste it to the chat. And again, this live coding session doesn't mean that we will be together building, right? I mean, we will, because you can follow the examples, uh, but I have no ability and no possibility to see if, uh, you know, like, what is your progress, right, on, on, on your local environments. But what is important here is that, um, you know, in the documentation here, and let me know if you, if you have access, uh, it is public, so you should. Uh, but here you have the four use cases described how to install the application, right? So you're cloning the repository. And then here you have even the commands of, on how to generate the public and the private keys. Uh, and guys, just one more, one more question. If you, uh, you know, like if you don't see that, I mean, can you see that clearly? Should I just zoom in or is it like just fine? Uh, and just use chat for answering if that's okay for you. Um, so we need to generate the public private keys, uh, make sure that, uh, okay, thank you, Mohammed. Oh, okay, thanks guys. Um, uh, so we need to make sure that the, um, that the rights are, um, are properly set, then create those application, this application. And one more thing, for the fourth, for the last use case, we will be, building something on top of Oro, right? So there will be a case where we will be extending uh, the API. It's not always the case, right? It's not always the case, but uh, yeah, I shared that. It's not always the case, but it is also to show you how easily and flexibly you can extend the current uh, API to also cover your specific use cases. Uh, so in order for that final um, for that final uh, exercise to, to 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 work, you need to copy the whole content of our Oro directory. So here, this is a bundle. This is a very simple bundle. To the source directory of your Oro Commerce project. So have a look. Um, and yeah, clear the cache, uh, then install the dependencies, Node.js, uh, no, uh, dependencies, and run the development mode, the development server, so that you can access the localhost. Uh, okay, let me see. And this is the final, um, the final result. Uh, okay, so let's see that in action. So first of all, let's see, this is a switcher of showing you the result, right? So that if you get lost with the, if you get lost with the, uh, with the example maybe, or, you know, like you need some help, you can always switch the, uh, the, 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 the switcher or switch it on and see uh, the real example. And this is the real example that is communicating with my uh, instance of uh, the um, headless Oro. Uh, this is listing all of the landing pages, and here this is a list of the, just listing the single like one, just one single uh, landing page. Um, now the structure, uh, we still have 20 minutes, plenty of time, perfect. So let's see the code, because this is what the developers like the most. Um, so let me just simply move that window. Okay. okay. 
And here, this is the this is the repository, right? So just a few more things that I need to cover the structure. Um, here you have the API gateway, which is a helper, kind of like a boilerplate, co boilerplate code. It's not that important uh, for you, right? I mean, it's important for you to use it, but not necessarily important for you how it works. Uh, it has just a few methods. Again, this is just a POC. So to generate the token, a fetch, uh, or just kind of like a get uh, a request that is using the fetch um, a promise in uh, the uh, in the, 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 the body of uh, that method. And we will be using that. So you don't need to change here anything, right? This is our helper component. Here we have a configuration that the only thing that does is just importing the configuration file from the configuration JSON. And this is important for you because let me see why I cannot uh, zoom it. Okay, so if something will not be clear, just let me know. Uh, here we have the base API URL. I am using the headless or local host, which is our headless or local host. Here, the token endpoint, end this is always auth to token. The client ID, client secret, which we will generate here in the storefront auth application. And this is some helper things for the cookies that uh, I needed to, or for the local storage that I needed to, uh, to keep the token in. Um, okay, what else? Let me see. And yeah, the uh, pages, uh, the index. So this is our index. This is our index page, uh, which is this one. Uh, you will see that also as well. Let's switch it off. We will not show the solution. So once the first use case that we'll be covering is when you have like, you know, your content editors build uh, the landing pages in some fancy web builder, uh, you know, software that uh, has all the effects uh, and, that, and, you know, like simply look modern. And you have those content editors creating those landing pages there. But at the same time, you want, you want to sync those, uh, those changes to Oro so that the data is available in your system. Um, for the buyers, right? Not in the system in the backend, but for your buyers. So here in the first use case, we will be creating a headless UI for the landing pages, so-called a blog, right? So let's see that once again, so-called a blog with some examples of the landing pages that are taken directly from the marketing and landing pages here, right? So the source of the true is our Oro Commerce backend. And when we go here, let's say that now I'm emulating this uh, uh, external third-party service, and I'm building the I'm building the uh, integration. Once that got integrated, we want to display the changes to our users, right? So in a separate UI in the headless uh, in the headless application. Okay, so let's go back and let's see how we can do that. Right now. This is our use case that we will be covering. We, by accessing the landing page, we are accessing the this particular landing page uh, component or yeah, the, the, the React component that simply displays what we see here. Uh, yeah, and we can see it here. Uh, the thing that we want to... Uh, so, so how to quickly accelerate that example and how quickly show how we can uh, kind of like, uh, you know, fit it with some data. Let's use a React use effects so that, and guys, one more thing. We, uh, uh, not we, but uh, that expect some kind of uh, an experience in, uh, where do the simple thumbnails come from? Alex, uh, I will get back to you in a minute. Uh, so that requires a bit of knowledge of JavaScript, but just just a simple, um, you know, that those simple uh, basic knowledge. Uh, I chose the React because of that, and Next.js actually for the because of the easiness of like you know it's really easy to set up the application, and for the CSS I'm using the tail Tailwind. 
so don't be if you get lost just don't worry right it's uh, you know like you have the final here the final solutions the final uh, you know like the, the final solution of this particular example so that you can always have a look at it and copy even copy paste to kind of like see if uh, this is you know like if the, this is what you're doing the, the 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 right thing so here we would need to set the pages uh, so how to use the pages right how to where to get those pages from so in the typical approach in the headless approach we need to use the api so why don't we just look at our api gateway to get the data from it so one more thing to cover here is that we need to authenticate right we need to simply authenticate in order to get the data but let's uh, have a one step back to see if we can do that without the authentication. So we will have the async function, let me see it like that, uh, fetch pages, that is doing the stuff here. So the fetching pages, okay, the fetching pages. Let's see if that worked. So we have that fetching pages here. Now we want to, uh, to gather all of the landing pages that are available from the system. So let's go to our storefront API right here, find the landing page. This is the landing page. And by using Swagger, you, are, you can actually see what is the result of that particular request. So this is our get that we would need. Let me copy that. And here is the model that is being returned, right? Encapsulated under the data element. So let's go ahead and let's use the API gateway. API, gate, oh, API gateway. Come on. Okay, and let me uh, fetch those API gateway, fetch, not fetch, but get, let's get. And let's see to the loaded pages. Okay, so we are getting the, uh, we are getting the pages. Let's see what that will result in. Uh, okay, one more thing, <laughs> one more thing, because I was using the final solutions, I already had a token generated. So once we, uh, once we try to fetch the pages as is, they are, uh, you know, the, you see the error that you need to authenticate first. So the thing to here to, uh, or not the thing, but the, uh, the, the important um, thing that I should, that I, would like to mention is that even though you are in the guest context, you always need to have a token. Right? This is the, actually the main, um, the main idea, the main uh, purpose of the first exercise. Right? To always be authenticated. So once we are <coughs> authenticated, right? We don't have an error anymore, and let's see if we had the landing pages. Console log. Oh, let's let's do it like this. Okay, this is okay. So we have the data, and as we can see, we have all of our landing pages uh, loaded properly. So this is a very simple example of the communicating of our headless UI, separate UI, with our. Uh, with our bucket. And one more thing that I forgot to mention, uh, and this is really, really important, in your Oro Commerce application, make sure to allow the origin localhost 3000. Why? Because otherwise you will have the course errors, right? You will not be able to communicate with the, um, with the, separate, with the backend, right? So that's why this is really, really important to copy the, the bundle to 
the um, to your instance of the um, of your of your oral commerce project. Um, all right. So once we have the landing pages uh, loaded, we can simply have a look and uh, load. Maybe I'll, we have 10 minutes, so maybe I should copy some of that from the final so that it got easier to follow. So if we have the landing loaded data and the loading data has the data attribute, we can then set the pages and then by adding or by like keeping the state, the React state, here we will simply got those this element re-rendered, right? So we'll iterate over the pages and display the attributes at the screen. So as you can see, we can uh, we will see we will, we can see that at the screen right now. So we can also uh, you know like using Tailwind, which is really uh, like a very fancy thing, which I really really like. Um, uh, to kind of like you know display a bit uh, a bit more a bit of like a you know, like more appealing um, um, more appealing design. So if we copy if we have here that part if we copy that and access here by just applying a few classes right just some flags maybe some images that we, let's comment it out so that we don't have a um, we don't have the images and there is a final on variable. Let's set it to false. And let's see if that worked. Go back. Yeah, we see a bit, you know, like a bit, maybe, maybe not so appealing, but at least that started to look uh, a bit more clear. So that let's add a bit more. Uh, here a bit more um, CSSs so that after refreshing, we can see the blocks that are being rendered in here. And let's just add those images. These images are that would need to be fetched from the API, but just to uh, you know to, to have the clear, um, use case. So let's use the placeholders here. So I'm using the unsplash.com to have some examples of the of the images, and let's have that uh, images being rendered in here. So let's see. Oh, that started to look somehow appealing, let's say, or a bit better than it used to. And then also we can uh, apply some another, like maybe like that, some other, um, you know, heading maybe, and let's also cover that in some additional CSS mm, or HTML blocks so that we can have how many of them, four or three? One, two, three, four, let's see. Mm, it's still not those, maybe three. That no uh, one two one two three no just two and once we refresh we can see our example that is the final uh, that looks exactly like the final one uh, and again guys uh, this is just for uh, showing the use case, right? It's obviously there is much more that can be done, but by using this, uh, you know, like a how many few CSS classes, I added a few, obviously it took me some time to uh, to prepare the styling, but here you can just simply copy that and adapt that according to your, to your requirements. We can build a proof of concept that you can then use to kind of like show to the, not management, but to the product owner to talk to him about the, uh, the headless approach. Then the second thing, the second uh, use case, uh, and by the way, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat. I will try to, as I see, we, uh, we have like around 10 minutes. I will try to answer those uh, on our Slack, on our public Slack. Then another one, another use case, uh, the barcode scanner. So let's assume that we have a use case that our um, grocery shops that we have the, 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 the software built for, 
they want to use the barcode scanning application to scan those products and automatically purchase them in a recurring orders. And there is a pretty much a real use case where we had a, a, a barcode scanning um, application that want that simply, you know, like a dentist, because it was a dentist um, area. Uh, they simply, whenever they were going out of stock of the products, because they saw it in, the, uh, in, in their offices, they could scan those products and those products were then synchronized to the oral instance. So here we will try to build something similar, uh, but again, this is just a proof of concept, right? So I found uh, the, some, some library, like barcode scanning library, uh, not really like a reliable, I would say, uh, or at least I couldn't make it to be that reliable, but it is enough for the, uh, for the purpose of the uh, webinar. And instead of automatically add that to the recurring order, we will, uh, we will utilize a product search with the product catalog. And this is what you can see right here, right? This is the same catalog that you could see in our, uh, in our Oro instance right here, industrial pricing labor and so on. And whenever the barcode that we are trying to scan uh, matches the product that will use the product search to, to find those products with those given barcodes. And then we can extend that example to automatically, let's say, if the product that was found was only one, right? So this is a specific product with a specific barcode, then add it automatically to the shopping list. Uh, and then, you know, like by scanning those products, those grocery shops, after finishing that activity, then can go back to the, uh, to your, like a, default uh, UI in the Oro commerce in the shopping list, and then, uh, you know, like finalize the shopping. So have a look how easy or how, what kind of customer experience is that, right? You don't need to type those products, but you have the barcode scanning application. You go around your office or your shop, you scan those products that you want, and they will automatically be added to the shopping list, right? So have a look how uh, nice customer experience we have here. Um, so instead of uh, the, this is a real, this is working, right? This has the camera uh, integration and it actually scans the real barcode. But since we have like four minutes, I will not be able to connect my phone to the, the in that time. So, uh, so I will just show you the, the example of that. And probably we will not be able to build it. So I will use the final version of that. So the main idea is the same. Have a look. Here we have the API gateway in our scanner component. Here we have the fetch products. And now what kind of API endpoint I am using? Let's go to the storefront again. This is the storefront, Swagger. I will find the product search here. And here is the extensive documentation on how to use that particular endpoint. So again, we don't have time to cover that. But you can uh, read that with all the examples and you know, like those kind of uh, uh, sandbox that you can actually try right, with a search query and how that search query is then parsed to give you the products. Uh, I did it before the webinar. So this is the result. I'm using the product search here. Let's say uh, like this product search endpoint with the search query equals to all texts equals to the barcode that we are scanning. And the sort is not relevant. Uh, so once that is loaded, we will simply set the products. And in the React use effect, whenever the, um, um, the UI the, is, is rendered, uh, we then use the site effect, the use effect to fetch the products. In here in the same, um, in the same function, we will render the uh, we will set up the barcode scanning, which is, this is the scanner that I'm using. Uh, and in the fetch products, we, yeah, we, we fetch those products and set it to the state of the React. And the same we do on the scan success, right? When we have a successfully scanned barcode, we fetch the products. And here I'm just adding some uh, uh, barcodes to the, to, to the array here so that we can see the history of the searches, right? So that we can see that this barcode is really uh, the, the thing that we were, we were just scanning. Uh, 
And the UI is really, really simple. Have a look. Uh, there is like a bunch of the elements with the CSS classes with some headers. And then here at the side, we have our barcodes list. And here we have the products which we are mapping here and showing the images, the attributes, so the name here, and also the minimal price, right? So have a look how, like, you know, by, by setting that in, I don't know, like a 15 minutes, maybe a few hours, uh, by setting up this really easy and probably, you know, and not that appealing, but uh, uh, not that production ready, but uh, anyway, the, the UI, you can display the products from the, or you can build a prototype and show that prototype with the barcode scanning application that, by the way, works pretty well on the mobile. Uh, and, but you can check that on your end, on your own. The third example uh, is about the profile. And this use case is just to show you how to use the context of a current customer user. Right, so when uh, obviously we are missing one thing, we are missing the authentication uh, form, right? So that uh, here, have a look here. I'm providing the username and password, uh, just uh, you know, like um, in the plain, uh, in the plain here on, from hand. But uh, usually that would be some kind of a form that will be then accessing the fields and generating the token. But here, by using the mine in identifier. You don't need to know the ID of that customer, right? So have a look, going back to the Swagger, customer users, instead of providing the ID of the given customer, you can use the mine context so that the application, the Oro Commerce, headless Oro Commerce, headless ready uh, Oro Commerce instance will identify the currently authenticated customer user. So in our case, this is going to be our Amanda call, right? With the email Amanda example org. Again, uh, since we are running really out of time, uh, just uh, uh, this, this UI is really even simpler than the previous ones. It's just a bunch of CSS and then, you know, like accessing the first, last names and some attributes of that particular user. So obviously everything is fetched from the API. And the last one is with the, the same example, but in case you want to add some additional information to the page. And if you don't want to uh, kind of like access multiple API endpoints in order to, to, to fetch the data, just to avoid, let's say, network delays, you can extend the Oro API by creating the specific model. So this is the profile model that I created with some data, whatever the data is, and configuring our API to expose the data. Then whenever the request comes for, from the, or for the profile, my newly created model, then this particular processor will be uh, this pro processor will be executed and you can fill the data from some external services, from the database, right? From, I don't know, calling maybe third party applications, what, whatever, right? Sky's the limit here. Uh, again, you can have a look at the example. This is just a few classes, right? The profile data, the processor that will fill your data, uh, the API definition and the service definition for the processor plus maybe the routing um, the definition for the profile. And thanks to that, you will get everything at once. Again, uh, guys, the UI is very simple, very uh, straightforward. So I will, um, I will not be covering that here. You have the code repository link in here. Feel free to play with it. Um, uh, feel free to reach me out, um, you know, drop me an email or, or find me in the, 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 our public Slack channel. I will try to answer your questions and help you with setting up this proof of concept. And uh, yeah, I hope that guys, you had a good time uh, with, uh, you know, at least uh, 
my, my main goal was to see, to, to show you how to easily you can use the Oro Commerce, right? Because this is really, really easy to set up the uh, POC application uh, in hours. So to sum it up, how, what are the use cases for the headless Oro Commerce? So let's say that you have a multi-website or multi-organization set up. You can have different brands that they have, that, that, that they can have their own individual stores or applications, you know, like based on that, that our single unified backend, our Oro Commerce backend. Or on the other hand, you can have B2B and B2C users, right? But using totally different experience. And this experience, I told you, I mean, I mentioned that during our presentation, is really crucial. So if they are got used to the different experience, maybe they expect different things from you. Maybe the headless approach is also the case for you. Let's say B2B using a default theme in Tweak, the, 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 the things that I showed you with the, with the um, default Oro Commerce setup and the B2C using the React modern, you know, like uh, fireworks everywhere application uh, that, uh, that the users would expect. And the third one is related to the marketplace. Uh, the marketplace where you have, uh, where you can connect the sellers and buyers, but since their activities are totally different, right? Because sellers want to upload the product, since the buyers want to buy them, you can also use so-called a seller portal, and this is also a, 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 like a real use case uh, that we covered and created um, some of the approaches that uh, uh, that actually, you know, like was was all around the sellers and the buyers here. Um, here you have a link to our old Slack, the public one. So feel free to reach me there. Um, the slides will be at, uh, will be provided to you after the webinar, and the recording, I believe, will be also available very soon. Uh, it's uh, six minutes past four, but let's see the questions. It would also be interesting to understand the possibility of having a hybrid approach where I can only rewrite some components of the storefront, for example, product page. And this is a perfect question. And this is actually the thing that I have, uh, that I built uh, last week, um, if I'm not mistaken. So have a look. Uh, when you go to the documentation and you can, you can find the Integrate React. Um, integrate React um, documentation so that you like this is like step by step showing you how you can uh, not even rewrite but actually also merge or use the React components in, in the scope of the um, of the Oro Commerce current application right the current tweak templates uh, so that uh, you know like you will get the, by the way by the way I probably I can also attach maybe on Slack some kind of a proof of concept of this particular approach so that you can see that this is also possible. And also that was not really hard to accomplish. Okay, so guys, um, thank you very much for attending the webinar. And please, uh, if you can, uh, think about the, the possible next uh, topics that you we have a list of the, the topics, but maybe you, you expect something different here. The customer or the developers or attendees experience is also very important for us. So don't hesitate to um, drop me an email or um, just provide your ideas um, in Slack. We will take that into consideration and we'll try to prepare something just for you. Okay, so thank you very much and um, see you next webinar. Bye-bye.